the Good Shepherd Church here in Georgia. Um, I really encourage all our visitors to please. For, for my there's room on the back there for it looks like that mic is not it's just not cooperating today huh Uh, to be made this morning, and um, I'm not one of them, so. <laughs> Good morning. I just wanted to remind all you ladies about our wonderful Advent brunch that's coming up. We would love to have you there. It, we always have a wonderful program and enjoy a time of fellowship, and our secret uh, sisters are revealed. If we so choose, we can get new ones for the next year. So if you'd like to come, please bring a small generic gift with you if you don't have a secret sister, and that way everyone will have a, a little gift. But we really hope to see you there. And good morning again. Just look to your right and look to your left and look behind you. How wonderful it is to have this sanctuary filled up. I've got an announcement on behalf of the call committee for this morning. The call committee is pleased to announce that we have reached a significant milestone in the call process. The self-study, a document that summarizes information about our church, our community, our ministries, and our needs, has been completed and has been shared with the Florida Georgia District. The self-study also includes information provided by the congregation regarding the pastoral attributes that respondents feel are most important to us and the pastoral nomination forms. Literally, we could not have accomplished this without you and we're thankful you for your participation and support. As it relates to pastoral attributes, the top 10 list of attributes in order from most often selected to least are preaching content, preaching delivery, teaching ability, leadership, Worship, people skills, <laughs> counseling, initiative, thank you, lay leader development, and tied for 10th, assimilation of new members and tech. Over 60 members submitted these forms. We also received 60 pastoral nomination forms. That far exceeds the number that were submitted for the 2021 call process and is a positive reflection of the engagement of our members in this process. The self-study, pastoral attribute ranking information, and pastoral nominations constitute the formal process of requesting a roster of candidates for consideration as our next pastor. The call committee has been advised that it will take the district about four to six weeks to review the information and build a roster of candidates for our consideration. During this time, we ask each of you to bathe the call process with your prayers. Pray for those who will review the information that we've sent them. Pray for those who will build the roster of candidates. Pray for the candidates who will be presented to us for consideration. Pray for continued unity and support within the congregation as we move through this process. And pray especially that the will of the Holy Spirit is revealed to us. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. Thank you. Good morning. A quick word about the Thanksgiving meal that will be served immediately after the voters meeting. Um, after the worship service, we will ask those that are not voting members to leave the sanctuary and you can visit in the narthex, um, outside the information hallway. We have coffee and uh, water um, and then after the voters meeting, which should be 30 minutes or less, we are going to open the doors and invite people to come back in for the table prayer that will be done in the sanctuary. And then we will go and have a lovely Thanksgiving dinner. Thank you. Good morning. Y'all, there are so many new faces here, and um, how awesome, I'm going to repeat what Pastor said yesterday at the service, 
um, they do, Lena Maud. But how awesome it is to see a full church. That is the one thing about having one service as opposed to two. So I apologize for those of you that I don't know, and I hope the time comes that we get to know you. But you need to stop because I have lots I need to tell you. Um, so kind of as a summary, because there are so many who are new, this is actually an old picture, but it is um, taken in Guatemala, and those are students in Guatemala. This is a ministry that we have been a part of actually since 2009, which is really exciting. We partner with um, a church called Santa Cruz uh, Lutheran Church in Amatilan. First visited there in 2009. Um, I can actually say I personally have been there six times, uh, which is amazing, so it's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, we've been on four mission trips there. Um, we've also hosted Dr. Ellery, who also has become a, a Lutheran pastor as well, because he was so moved by the ministry that he was doing in Amatilan. And um, so he and his wife, Liz, we have been here at our church in 2015. And also we sponsored their son, Sammy, and another youth that we had met on our trips and sent them to the National Lutheran Youth um, Gathering that was in um, New Orleans that year, and then he came to visit us, and we went tubing, and we had a lot of fun. They were and, and did some exciting things. So also, in 2016, we started um, sponsoring children that were coming to the church there, and the church there, it's on a lake. And, but the people they serve, they live it on what were the old railroad tracks that in Guatemala, they decided that trucking business, who owned that, was more important than the rail, so they shut the rails down. And so a lot of people then just um, moved there and built shanties, you know, whatever they could find. And so those are the people that Dr. Ellery and Liz ministered to. So... These children, we um, have now, this is our eighth year, these eight years we've been sponsoring children to be able to go to school, to be able to have a, the uniform that's needed, to have the supplies they need. They go to this church, it's their safe haven. They have tutoring, they have EDS, they have Bible study, they have worship service. They get fed um, nutritional meals, and it gives them an opportunity to have a life beyond that life on the railroad track. And so we're just asking for you, um, if anyone would like to sponsor for um, 2025, because there's, I mean, 24, their school year goes from uh, January until November. And so they'll be starting up in January, so they're just coming to the completion of this school year. Um, we have been asked again to, um, if we can support 20 students, 10 primary students, and that's $200 a child, or for the um, basic, which is like our middle school, kind of middle school, high school, um, it's $300 a child. So just please pray about it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, and I am delighted to um, answer those questions and give you any other information. But the, the primary thing that these people receive is they get the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, in, in our last update from Dr. Ellery, there was a baptism of a 15-year-old. There were, um, and at that baptism, her family came. It was the first time her family had ever been in the church. Um, and so they are getting the truth and the, the true word of God, and it is making a difference in their lives. So... Thank you so much for your past support and look forward to another year. Thank you. And um, now it's going to be my job to try and get us out of here in time. So um, let's just, this is a brand new. Try and tune that up. There you go. Thanks.
Yeah, we swapped out my lapel mic for a new one. So, all right, and I'm going to put this back on the thing. But let's stand and begin our worship service with song. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. 
for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord this is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. with you. And so we pray, stir up, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people so that they may bear many fruits of good works and because of your faithfulness, receive your great reward through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please. Testament reading today comes from Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 7 to 16. Be silent before the Lord of God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guest. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's son and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and who, those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm today we will read responsively by verse, Psalm 90, verses 1 to 12. 
Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Turn man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath, we are dismayed. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. Considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
Now hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of heaven. He says, It will be like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them, and he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, and saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me the two talents. Here I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gathered where I scattered no seed. Well, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. seated. Grace be unto you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God that engages us in meditation this morning, I'm going to primarily uh, unpack for you the the parable that I just read to you from from the Gospel of Matthew. But before I get to it, I, I, I also want you to see the context that uh, our, all of our readings kind of set up for that parable to hit us just exactly where Jesus wants it to. You heard in those readings that there's a lot of kind of warning language in the scriptures, that, uh, that God, uh, or the Holy Spirit, you know, through the prophets, he's saying, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a coming day of judgment And when that coming day of judgment arrives, boy, you don't want to find yourself on the wrong side. And so that's the context. You can reread the the first lesson, the second lesson that we heard. Even the psalm has it in there. Um, And then, of course, at the very end of the gospel, uh, the the parable that Jesus tells just kind of describes being on the wrong side of, uh, of the judgment as being a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the rest of the parable, Jesus describes two different kinds of people. And I know there are three 
examples in the parable. But if you look carefully, the first two are essentially exactly the same. I'll get to the idea of t five talents versus two talents in a moment. But if you look at how the master responds to them, and if you look at how they handled the, uh, the, the idea of having been given these talents to begin with, you'll see the, these two are identical. The, so for the remainder of this sermon, I'm going to refer to the two kinds of people that Jesus teaches about in the parable. The first kind being servant number one and servant number two, and the second kind being servant number three. Now, uh, you, the, the details of the parable are something like this. There's a, there's a master, and uh, you know, just it doesn't take long to unpack these parables. You understand, in Jesus' telling of the parable, he's going to be the master. He's speaking about himself, and he's talking about the idea that the time that we're living in is this time where he, it seems like he's gone away, but he's coming back, and that's certainly in the theme of the, the th Thessalonians reading. And, and all these uh, warning readings is that he's returning. And when he returns, there's going to be this accounting and, and what have you. So he's the master. Now, what are these talents? First of all, I'd like you to know that in, in Jesus' day, and so the context that he's teaching in, a talent was a, a weight of measurement. They measured money by weight. Okay, we don't do that. A $10 bill weighs the same as a $100 bill. But, uh, you know, in, in Jesus' day, uh, uh, the more your gold or silver or copper, the more it weighs, the more it's worth. A talent, a single talent, was somewhere around 20 years' worth of working. So let the record show that the guy who got only one talent didn't exactly get screwed. <laughs> All right, and the guy that got the five talents has been given an absurd amount to work with. And that's characteristics of the, of the parables of Jesus. There's always things in his parable that clue you in that what he's talking about isn't literal and, uh, and that it's a, a teaching tool, it's a device, it's a parable. And so some of the things mean things and some of the things don't. And so you try and unpack it and you be faithful about it. Now, uh, this first kind of person uh, recognizes that they've been given an enormous gift, a trust from the master. And maybe it's even convenient that in English the Greek word gets translated as talent because it's probably wise for us to understand that the gifts that God gives us, as it says, to each according to his ability, that includes to each according to her ability as well, um, the gifts that God gives us sometimes result in, you know, five talents worth of money. Some people become wealthy in, by means of the gifts that God gives them. In our culture today, if you're a super duper whiz at math, the way our culture is kind of geared toward technology and, I mean, you can become super wealthy if you're a, a math whiz. Um, but, you know, you're probably not going to become super wealthy if your gift is interpreting the Hebrew text <laughs> uh, or, or digging a ditch, right? But the point, the first point of the parable is if your gift is ditch digging, you've been given an enormous gift from God. So even though in these ancient cultures it was common to look down at people based on the kind of the class of 
person that they fall into. And a ditch digger would have fallen into a very low class because the Greek mythology, all the Greek stories about the Greek gods, they really kind of caused people to think about each other in terms of where is their status with respect to everyone else in their culture. And that's why Socrates said, look, if you really want to have a good life, if you really want to be blessed, become a philosopher, become a thinker, get into the information business, said Socrates. And, and so, of course, in Greek culture, if you couldn't achieve a certain level of professionalism, you were way down here and looked down upon. Um, other ancient cultures, those are sort of Western ancient cultures. The Eastern ancient cultures had their problems as well, and it also uh, kind of derived from their god mythologies. The, Babylon, the big, big mythology from the East was the, the Enuma Elish, kind of the Babylonian Marduk creation story, where Marduk created the world be because it, it kind of came out of a, a big, angry fight among the gods gods and Marduk just kind of happened to win and so he sliced open the god that he defeated and that's how he made the world and then he invited the other lesser gods to come and enjoy the world that he had made and they're all like hey Marduk that looks like a lot of work keeping that thing up and Marduk said oh yeah it is going to be a lot of work but don't worry we're going to make a primitive class of people called humans and we're just going to let them take care of all the work and we're just going to sit back and have a good time. And so in the, in the Eastern ideologies, there was also this sense that if you had to work with your hands, you were kind of a lesser kind of a person. And so in the, in the Greek mindset, in the, in the Eastern mindset, you could read this parable and say, hey, one guy got five and one guy got two and the guy that got one, boy, he really got the shaft. No, 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 no. This isn't the way it works in Scripture. The Christian scriptures are completely different than every other man-made mythology. Because if you go to the Christian creation story, you'll find a God who's a ditch digger. When God made man, he reached his own hand down into the dirt and dug a ditch and made a human out of it. And then he took that human and he put him and he gave him work to do. Do you realize that there's work to do for Adam and Eve in paradise? See, that goes against the Greek mythologies also. How many of you know the, the mythology of Pandora's box? If you know it, you know it wasn't really a box, it was a jar. You know, so uh, Greek mythology fans, you probably really appreciate that I pointed that out. But the myth goes like this. Zeus had given Pandora this jar, and, and unfortunately she opened it, and out popped all of the evil things that plague mankind. And do you know what was in that box? Work. See, according to the Greek mythology, work is a curse. But according to God, a work is a gift. Because it, it's one of the ways that God helps give your life meaning. He fills your, he creates you and fills your life up with all these things that you can do and you do them in a different way than she does them and that he does them. And so finding the way for you to take the five or the two or the one talent that God has given you, and when I say talent, let's just say with a capital T, because it's some gift, and I'll show you that in a little while. But taking that and finding a way to have a meaningful life in the kingdom of heaven. How do you do that? Young folks here in the, in, the, in the crowd this morning, I really want you to pay attention because what I'm going to offer you this morning, in this text, what Jesus is offering you, is a way to have a life filled with meaningful work. A way for you to, if it's going to be digging ditches, a way for you to dig ditches and sing about it all the live long day. And here's what the text is teaching us. Jesus is doing this, not me. He's saying if you want to have a, a, a meaningful life in this 
laborious world that we live in, and that I mean in a positive way, um, you, you first have to look in, then you have to look out, and then you have to look up. Now, what do I mean by that? And it's in the text. First, you have to look in. You have to see who you are. And find the things that God has given you. He does not make each one of us the same as any of the rest of us. He makes some of us to be artists and musicians. He makes others of us to be doctors and scientists. He makes some of you really good (laughs) at fixing this hair problem that seems to be growing worse by the week. (laughs) He has made you that way. He's given you the things that you need to have a meaningful life of work. So you have to start, you have to look in, you have to take stock of who you really are. What kind of really makes you thrum inside when, you, when you're occupied by doing? Start there, but don't stop there. Because the second thing you need to do is you need to look around and you need to figure out how it is that your set of gifts and talents meets the needs of the world around you. That's part of what actually makes working meaningful. It isn't just that you get to do what you want to do. It's that the things that God has enabled you to do actually line up with the needs of the world around you. And this is why there are some people who take their good gifts and they destroy them by using them to oppose the world around them. And you see people doing this in the world all the time. I have to say, I'll give you a crude example. God makes some people beautiful, physically gorgeous, and they become prostitutes. And they use their physical beauty to destroy people instead of bless them. Well, that's just a crude example. There are, there are examples like that in every kind of possible industry. Um, but it's not enough just to look in and to, just to look out. Then you want to look up because... Your work will find meaning when you see the connection between your calling from heaven and your day-to-day activity on the earth. I'm going to give you one example of this. It's a real-life example. A guy by the name of John Coltrane. Let me see your hands if you know who I'm talking about. All right, I knew. John Coltrane was the great sax player of the 20th century. I mean, he played jazz, and and he got better with age. Oh, my goodness, John Coltrane. And uh, in the liner notes to uh, A Love Supreme, this was a beautiful uh, piece of music that he uh, wrote and performed many, many, many times. Um, he, He had this to say in his liner notes. He says, during the year 1957, I experienced, by the grace of God, a spiritual awakening which would lead me, a spiritual awakening which would lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. And at that time, in gratitude, I humbly asked to be given the means and privilege to make other people happy through music. The intersection between looking Upward, looking outward, and looking inward was described perfectly by an author by the name of Frederick Buchner who said that you know you found your calling, your godly purpose in life when your deep passion intersects with the world's deep need. Now, how do you find that? 
You've got to start with the creation story itself. The creation story itself tells us that God is the ultimate creator. In fact, the word, the Hebrew word that's used to describe God as creator, as saying, let there be light, and there was light. There's a word that translates into create, and that word specifically means to make something out of nothing. To start with zero raw material and end up with something. And that is a word in the Hebrew text that only ever refers to God. You can't do it. So let's get that out of the way for starters. Maybe you're an artist and you like to take raw materials like paint and canvas and make something beautiful out of it, see? Maybe you're a doctor and you like to take the raw materials of a person who's suffering and a medication and to bring them together and to, to relieve suffering. Or maybe you're a nurse and you understand that your role is to take a suffering person and, and the, the medication that's been provided and combine it with your your love for people and to make that person's recovery a more beautiful process. Maybe you're a hairdresser and I'm telling you if you're a hairdresser that the way you draw that comb through a person's hair brings beauty into the world and that's by God's design. Now there are other words that refer to creating things in the Hebrew text and they're other than the one that I already told you about. These are words that get translated into words like to make or to separate. And these are the words that also refer to how God took things and made other things out of them, like scooping his hand down into the dirt and making Adam. Uh, these are the words that refer to creating something out of something else, taking a set of raw material and making something beautiful out of them. And every single one of you have that talent. You retired folks. I want you to know something. Uh, you have opportunities. The, the, the talents that you have may look slightly different in retirement than the talents that you have while you're still working for a wage. And here's how I know that you retired folks have these talents to work with. The master hasn't returned yet. And as long as the master hasn't returned, you've got stuff to do. So what are you doing with the talents that God has given you in retirement? Can you look in and see what exactly is it that you have that's such a blessing from God? What is it that you can find as you look around that's a deep need in the community? And how does God call you to figure out how all that comes together? John, I see you sitting back there, and I know you're a doctor, and I know that uh, Good News at Noon Ministry is a place for you to exercise your good gifts because the community, the homeless community in our, com in our neighborhood needs a good doctor. And rather than use your good gifts to become more and more wealthy for yourself, you've looked in, you've looked around, and you've looked up, and you've found a meaningful person. I imagine you're one of the happiest doctors the world has ever known. Uh, you know, now let's get to the second kind of person. Because I've just described to you the first kind. The second kind of a person takes the talent and buries it in the ground because he has misjudged God. The second, the, the master comes back and says, all right, well, what's been going on around here? And the, the second kind of person comes to God and says, you know, God, I knew that you were a, the kind of person who reaps where he doesn't sow and who tries to gather up where he hasn't scattered seed. And frankly, that just is not true. That is not who God is. I'll tell you who God is. Uh, uh, yes, he starts out as a ditch digger, 
right? God is the one who got his hands dirty first. God, it says that, you know, after the six days of creation, it says that God rested from his what? Work. God's a worker too. But more than that, when Jesus was born, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus looked in, he looked around, and he looked up. And when you see how Jesus has treated this own parable in his own life, you'll understand even more deeply what it means that you've been given five talents. Here, so Jesus looked inward, and, and when, look, when Jesus was born, God became flesh. That's what the Bible says. Don't ask me to try and figure it out. If you do, let me know. It's a bizarre mystery, but Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. And he looked inside himself and he recognized, I'm a human being. And Paul puts it in these words. He says, Jesus understood when he looked inside, he said, ah, equality with God is not a thing to be grasped. Jesus understood his purpose. He, he understood he's, he may not be the guy with five talents. He may be the guy with two talents. He may have even been, been guy, the guy with one talent. After all, foxes have their holes and birds of the air have their nests. But the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. Jesus didn't make wealthy on his miraculous ability to do stuff. Can you imagine? Well, I mean, he could have been bigger than Elon Musk. He could take five loaves of bread and two fish, feed 5,000 people. Imagine what his house could have looked like. But he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, which meant he understood that as a human being, he had to interact with the world as a human being. And so, yes, he went around, and, and, he, and then he, after looking in, he looked around, and he, he saw the, the needs of his community. And this is where it really, I mean, this is where his gifts were put to the best use. Because, and again, if he, had, if he had looked inward and said, you know, I am just a human being, but I'm also God, and I, you know, I could probably get, all, get away with doing this a lot. He could have, the, the 5,000 people that he fed with five loaves of fish and two, he could have done that a whole lot easier. He could have just snapped his fingers, and all 5,000 of them could have gone, ooh, that was good. <laughs> Frankly, he could have snapped his fingers and every single sick soul in the entire region of Galilee could have woken up the next morning in perfect health. Jesus had that power. He didn't do it. Instead, he walked and he talked and he served and he dug the ditches that God sent him to dig. He got dirty. And then he looked up, and because when he looked around and he saw the size of the need, what he really saw was a whole world of people who got God wrong. A whole world of people who thought that God would be the kind of God who would reap where he does not sow and who would try to gather where he hadn't scattered any seed. They get God wrong. Do you know any people in your life, in your circles, who misjudge God as a snorting, angry man in the sky who's just going to smite people? If you do, tell them this story, that Jesus looked around and he saw all kinds of people like that. And he saw what kinds of people that turned them into. Hateful people, spiteful people, competitive people who only wanted to use their gifts to get ahead of other people instead of serve them. And Jesus looked around. He looked inside himself. He looked around. He saw this. And then he looked up. <laughs> And he saw he immediately knew what he was going to have to do. He would have to suffer and die to redeem all those people from exactly what they'd been warned against, a place where there is nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when he looked up and he said, Lord, I, I, I see the, I, this is a huge problem. What can I do? I, I, th I think he didn't even want to do it. But he knelt down to pray and he says, I'll tell you what, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. 
And in that moment, he found the intersection between the will of God, the needs of the people, and who he was. Only Jesus could suffer and die for the world. And he did. And that is the talent you've been given first. You've been given a, a life that you could never work hard enough to earn. You've been given five talents, ten talents, a million talents worth of life. Eternal life. That's what Jesus has given you. Now, take what I've taught you about how to practically make good on the gifts that you've been given and realize that the true gift is salvation in Jesus Christ because he went to the place where there's nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. He descended into hell and he blew a hole out the back end of it so that when you die, you you too shall live forever. That's the talent he's given you. And it's worth more than 20 years of labor, more than 200 years of labor. It's worth an eternity. Now take that and look inside yourself and see what kind of person that makes you. And then look around and see the need for people to hear that good news. And then look up and say, Lord, how can I serve you? Because the intersection of those things is where you will find such joy in your life that you will truly enter in to the joy of your master. Amen. stand as you are able as we go to our Lord in prayer. O oh, Father in heaven, you've made us children of the light and of the day. Now bless our homes. 
especially parents, as they teach their children your ways so that your people may walk as those armored in faith and love and salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O holy God, a nation that despises you will be as a sacrifice to others, for it has rejected you as its strength and shield. So grant repentance in our land, that our laws may be just, that our transactions might be honest, and that our love for others might be fervent. Lord, in your mercy. Give ear to our pleas on behalf of the afflicted for your name's sake. Preserve their life and grant them healing according to your will. In your righteousness, strengthen their faith through their trials and bring their souls from trouble. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God of life, your son died for us so that whether awake or asleep, we might live forever with him. Receive our thanks for for your kindness to all who have died in the faith, comfort those who mourn with the consolation that all who die in Christ live with him forever. We ask this blessing, especially for Erm at this time and his whole family as they grieve the loss of Lena Maud. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God of grace, preserve us from the temptation to consider you a hard and unmerciful master. Keep us mindful that you give us every good thing in abundance, most of all, a place in your kingdom. And so for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, continue to teach us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This concludes the online portion of our service, well, the broadcast portion of our service this morning. If you uh, want to share this service with any of your friends, you can do that already when you get home on Facebook. And then if you give us a couple of days, we'll have it uploaded on YouTube. Our worship service continues with the common preface, the Lord.